Hi, Assalamualaikum everyone. Welcome back. I hope you're all ready to learn more economics. Okay, so I do hope somehow you have your notes with you, but if you don't, um, rest assured there are plenty of lecture notes or online notes that you can gather from the internet. I've already provided the links in the class website. Okay, so where there's a will, there's a way. Have something to read, have some notebooks for you to jot down notes, okay? So anyway, this would be how we'll conduct our video lectures from now on. Um, I'm actually in the process of getting a proper tripod, so hopefully in future the angle will be better. But uh, I do hope that you'll be able to follow with the lecture, okay? So this is basically my own personal note. Um, so whatever scribbles you see here are basically just add-ons to the points that I've already typed for you, okay? So today's lesson is actually on the aggregate expenditures model. Okay, so this aggregate expenditures model is a model developed by British economist John Maynard Keynes around 90 plus years ago. Okay, so the, the main reason why he developed the model was to explain um, about the Great Depression. Okay, I think I may have, I may have mentioned this to you uh, in class before the MCO. Okay, uh, when, we, when we studied topic four, you know, uh, we began by giving you, oh, here, I do have my topic four here. Yeah, see this topic four here? I give you a bit of a history and we talked about the Great Depression and uh, one of the ways to alleviate or to solve the problem was to adopt the Keynesian economics, right? So what we studied here in topic four, oh, sorry, let's just bring it back. What we studied in topic four was basically three things. One was the income, consumption, and savings relationship. And we also studied um, about the uh, multiply effect, sorry, the relationship between interest rate and investment, as well as the multiply effect. Yeah, that was the last point, okay? So those three things we studied already under topic four. So now having known that basic, hopefully we can continue with the actual model, okay, which is the aggregate expenditures model. Right, um, the aggregate expenditures model is also known as the Keynesian cross. Okay, Keynesian coming from his name, John Maynard Keynes. Okay, so here's a definition of the model. The amount of goods and services produced uh, and therefore the level of employment depends directly uh, on the GDP level. So in other words, there's a positive relationship between GDP level and the amount of goods and services produced. And that will also affect amount of employment in the economy. Before we go into the details of the aggregate expenditures model, allow me to make a bit of introduction. Okay, So the main reason why we're learning this is so that we can determine and understand the real GDP equilibrium. You know what that means is, um, how is it that there is a balance between how much is being produced and how much is being consumed. So there are actually two methods to understand or to determine or to get the real GDP equilibrium. Okay, so the two methods are this one, what we're gonna learn, the aggregate expenditures model, and of course there's another approach called the leakage injection approach. So in this topic five, uh, if you browse through it, I will be discussing both of them. Okay, so what you see here is the first approach. Okay, so we will be learning both of them under the, uh, in order to determine the real GDP equilibrium. So how are we going to learn the aggregate expenditures model? Okay, I've broken down the model into several parts. The first is when the economy is private and closed. Of course, we're going to learn all of the assumptions under this setting, okay? And then slowly, we will loosen up one by one the assumptions and we'll come to the next phases. The second phase is when the economy is private and open and thirdly, when the economy is mixed and open. Okay, so when we reach the third phase, we've basically gotten the full model. Eh? All right? Okay, so now let's look at the first situation. When the economy is private and closed. Okay, let me just bring it closer to you. Okay, so anyway, these are the assumptions um, that we make when the economy is private and closed. You know what private means? Private simply means there's no government. Okay, so that is why here, absence of government. It entails that the economy is private. And what it means by closed is there is no trading happening. Okay, so in effect, how do we get GDP? It's only C plus IG. Again, why is it C plus IG only? There's no G, there's no XN, there's no government, there's no trade. Okay, so this is the uh, most basic assumption when the economy is private and closed. 
And of course, thirdly, and fourthly, there's the other assumptions which are, we will assume there's only personal savings and there's no depreciation. Now, the effect of all of this assumption is, okay, I've written it down here for you, okay, the effect or the implication of all of this is that, okay, by way of assumption number one and two, we can write this, aggregate expenditure is effectively only consumption and private uh, investment, okay? And with the assumption three and four, we can assume that GDP is equivalent to national income, personal income, as well as disposable income, okay? So anyway, uh, a lot of this is being explained uh, in the text in more detail. So um, I need to keep on reminding you that during the virtual lecture, I'm just going to be uh, explaining the important points. So for further elaborations, please do refer to the text. So today we're going to look at investment demand curve and investment schedule. Okay, so these two are two different things. Okay, so there's a difference between them. So here I've written down, what is the difference between the ID curve, investment demand curve and the investment schedule? Okay, so the investment demand curve shows the negative or inverse relationship between interest rate and the amount of planned investment. Okay, amount of planned investment. Whereas the investment schedule, okay, shows the amount of planned investment at each level of GDP. So now, by knowing this definition, we can actually understand how the diagrams look like. Very different, yeah? Okay, for investment demand curve, since it shows a negative relationship, as you can see here, Okay, this is how the investment demand curve looks like. You can ignore uh, the curve on the right here. Okay, so this is the investment demand curve, whereby there's a negative relationship between interest rate, amount of interest rate, and the amount of planned investment. What that means is, the lower the rate of interest, the more would be the amount invested, simply because it is now cheaper. Okay, to borrow and to invest. Right, so now let's look at the investment schedule. Okay, the investment schedule, on the other hand, it's not downward sloping. In fact, it's a straight line. Now let's go back to the definition here. It says that it shows the amount of planned investment at each level of GDP. So what it means is, regardless what the GDP level is, you'll have the same amount of planned investment. Okay, so IG here is gross investment, also known as the planned investment. Okay, so here, how do we interpret the schedule? We can say that at each GDP level, the amount of planned investment is 20 billion. Okay, so I've written down here a um, personal note. Why is it horizontal? Why is it a straight line? It's because it shows investment or planned investment at each level of GDP. And it is fixed because it does not include any unplanned changes in inventories. Let's look at the first approach to equilibrium GDP. Okay, so let's look at the first approach to understanding equilibrium GDP. Now remember, we are in an economy that is private and closed. Private and closed mean there's only C plus IG. Okay, so this is basically our equation. To get GDP is just C plus IG. C is the personal consumption, IG is the private spending. Now this part to the left is basically the output part, right? So output is generally the total output being produced. C plus IG is basically the aggregate expenditure at this point. So C plus IG is also, uh, you can say that this is the total quantity of goods and services purchased. Now if they are at equilibrium, meaning they are at balanced, at balance means, see, equals to what it means is there is no overproduction, no excess spending. So the economy is in equilibrium. Okay, so you may be wondering, um, why is this true? Um, how is it possible to be achieving or to achieve this state? The thing is, producers will be willing to produce, okay, on a certain level of output if they believe that they will receive identical level of income from the sales of those output. Okay, so basically at equilibrium, everything that's being produced will be purchased, all right? So now what happens if the economy is not at equilibrium, okay? So if it's not at equilibrium, it's basically the disequilibrium cases. Now there are two instances of disequilibrium cases. One is when the GDP falls below aggregate expenditure, okay? So this is called overspending. In other words, there's underproduction happening. Okay, remember, 
Okay, this part GDP is the total output produced. C plus IG is the aggregate expenditure. So if GDP is less than C plus IG, what it means is there's an overspending or an underproduction happening in the economy. Okay. And another case is when GDP is more than C plus IG. In other words, in this case, is what we have, we have underspending or overproduction. Okay, so it might be a bit confusing at this point, but if you remember, if you understand the equilibrium, hopefully you'll be able to understand the disequilibrium cases. Okay, so let's look at the disequilibrium cases in a diagram. Uh, apologies for all the scribblings. I do hope you can try to focus on what is being uh, mentioned only, okay? So in this diagram, it may look like there's a lot of things happening, but I just need you to focus on two lines, okay? The first line is the 45 degree line. This 45 degree line is representing basically our GDP, okay? GDP or income. Remember our assumption at the very beginning, assumptions number three and four, okay? So following the assumptions three and four, we can assume that the GDP is equivalent to all of our incomes, right? So that is why here I've written it as the 45 degree line is equals to GDP or income, All right? So the second line that you need to focus on is this one, the C plus IG. Please ignore the C here because we're not just looking only at consumption, we're looking at consumption plus um, gross investment, okay? So at the point where C plus IG cuts through the GDP line, we have equilibrium, okay? Uh, I hope that's understood. Now let's look at the first case of disequilibrium. Here we have GDP is less than C plus IG. So where are we looking at? Here. Okay, at equilibrium just now, the amount of GDP was 470 billion. But when we are producing 410 billion, you can see here, if you draw an imaginary line, you can see that this point, which is C plus IG, is much higher than GDP. Okay, so there's a wedge here. This wedge is basically the disequilibrium bit. C plus IG is more than GDP. So the wedge here represents overspending. We're spending more. Okay, if you can draw another imaginary line here, we are spending about 430 billion, but our production is only 410 billion. See, so there's over, uh, overspending is uh, basically explained at this point. Now, here if you look, ideally we produce this much, but we're producing only this much. Therefore, we have here underproduction. Okay, so I repeat. When we look at the wedge here, the wedge or the difference between uh, aggregate spending and GDP, here we have overspending. Here we can see that the total production is much less than the equilibrium GDP, so here we have underproduction. Here's overspending, underproduction. So when we have the first case of disequilibrium, how can we go back to equilibrium? Okay, here's written in the notes. When this type of disequilibrium happens, okay, what we can say is there is actually a decline in the unplanned inventories, right? Because we are producing much less than what we plan, what it should be here. So when there's a decline or when there's a fall in the unplanned inventories, we can see that output, employment, and income will tend to rise because firms realize that, hey, why are we only producing here? Whereas we can, you know, we have the capacity to expand production up to this point so they'll have more motivation to increase their production okay so when firms raise their production this will drive gdp upwards towards uh, equilibrium okay so now let's look at the second type of disequilibrium case where gdp is more than c plus ig in other words we have overproduction or underspending looking back at our diagram this time around we will look here see Ideally, we produce this much because this is where the economy is at equilibrium. But if for whatever reason we're producing much higher than that at 510 billion, we can see that as we go up this line. See here, yo, um, GDP line, because GDP is represented by the 45 degree line, right? So GDP here is much higher than C plus IG. So this wedge here is called the underspending bit. Okay, in other words, here you can actually compare at this point. Okay, production is 510, but our spending is much less, maybe around 500 or 490. Okay, so that is why here we're seeing this underspending happening. 
okay, we are producing more than uh, what's been consumed. And here, if you compare, this should be our ideal uh, equilibrium production, but we're producing more. So this is what the overproduction uh, looks like. So now, how do we get from this disequilibrium to going back to equilibrium? Okay, so when this happens, okay, I've written down the notes here. Uh, when we are producing much more than optimal, okay, we'll realize um, all the firms will have the tendency to cut production. Okay, so output, employment, income will tend to fall when the economy or when firms as a whole, they cut the production together. Okay, so by that way, what happens is... Um, when firms cut production, the GDP will decline gradually towards equilibrium level. So, I repeat, what happens is when we have either one of the disequilibrium cases, okay, it will naturally go back to the equilibrium level. So, the basic understanding is that whenever we have disequilibrium, what we can say is it's either unplanned inventories decline or unplanned inventories rise. So, the mechanics that's going on is the economy will go back to equilibrium.